Welcome to another program of U.S. Farm Report, brought to you by the members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. We have as our special guests Bob Menke from Wisconsin and Ken Stoffrin from South Dakota. Both of these gentlemen are farmers who are members of the National Farmers Organization Board of Directors from their respective states. Recently, this past week, we've heard some statements both from high government officials, the Secretary of Agriculture, concerning the food situation and the prices of food mainly. During this period, I, from a, uh, from a Wisconsin, state of Wisconsin, have been noticing something happening very drastically in this state. In one week, in the Eau Claire paper, we had 14 auctions listed. In another area, we had over 983 mature dairy animals being sold in one week. This has been very prevalent recently. I would like to have Ken take and analyze this as what is the farmer's image? Where do we go? What are the problems and how do we solve these at the present time with government involved in this situation? Thank you, Bob. Today, I would like to talk just a little bit concerning the public image that agriculture has had, perhaps for several decades, but perhaps this is more important today than ever before, because I believe that in the past few recent weeks at least, the statements concerning the image of agriculture has not been to uh, the industry's benefit at all. We've been led to believe, as the American public at least, that uh, in the past few years, that agriculture has pretty much been subsidized and that, that the public is led to believe at least that the tax dollar that they spend has been used to pay the farmer or the, uh, in relation to these subsidies, that paying the farmer for the production that he has produced and uh, thereby bringing us into a period of decreased public image as far as agriculture is concerned. This we believe to be a very devastating as far as an industry is concerned. And what we'd like to do is perhaps correct some of the uh, misinterpretations so that we can bring some of the facts to you and concerning the agriculture and its pricing structure, the production factors, and maybe bring some of the points to you so that you can better understand the condition that agriculture is in. Bob mentioned some of the factors that were taking place as far as the production is concerned in the state of Wisconsin and some of the economic conditions as a result of it. The listing of sales that we have seen here recently has gathered quite a little momentum and impetus to the point where at least it, it seems to be running rampant that the sales are taking place, the liquidation of herds. Not only uh, are they perhaps selling out and being located into other herds, but there are many going to slaughter. I think we've found ourselves this year more than any other time in a period of closer balance between the supply and the consumption of major commodities in agriculture than we've ever seen before. To a large extent in the dairy industry, at least, that we found ourselves in a very critical shortage of dairy products. To the point, at least, that it looks to us like it's going to be very hard to catch up in the production cycle to produce enough to meet the consumption needs of the American public for years to come. Now, this not only shows itself pretty much in the dairy industry, but we found the same things taking place in the other major commodities. We've been led to believe for several years that agriculture was producing surpluses in the line of livestock products, of grain products, and of dairy products. Now, we've found and we've taken an analysis of this for several uh, years already. But in taking the statistics from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and using their own statistics, the livestock and meat situation, the farm income situation, all of the available statistics from several departments, that we've found that with the domestic production, together with the imports that we've had, 
on several of these commodities that we have had a balance between the supply and the consumption of these products. And yet at the same time, we've been led to believe that the surpluses are the factor involved in the pricing mechanism that the farmers were not entitled to a fair price because of this overproduction. We would like at least to bring you up to date a little bit more on the, on the production as far as its statistics are concerned and exactly where we are as farmers in the production and pricing mechanism. Now, as we've said before, that we can take the U.S. Department of Agriculture statistics and, and bring it to uh, the public to show that we have had a balance between these the supply and the consumption of these products, together with the imports, will lead us to exactly in this balance. But today, we found at least that we've, uh, we've come upon a period of critical shortage of these products. And for the analysis, perhaps, on the supply-demand mechanism that we hear so much about, and that this is responsible for a price structure. I would like to have Bob Mankey expound just a little bit more, perhaps, on this. Bob? One of the things that I'm going to be doing today in order to take and bring this out more clearly is use some of the other people's admissions and figures in arriving at our conclusions. One of the statements that the president recently made that food is an important factor in the cost of living rise. Now let's take and analyze this statement. The American public is spending around 19 cents out of every spendable dollar for food. This is the lowest price in the history of America or any other country that the consuming public can spend so little for so much food. Now, how can this reflect in the rise of the cost of living? I would like to take a report from one of the leading commission firms from the Sioux Falls Yards. Taking the 1948 basic rates Industry had pr prices went up 50%. What would parity be on hogs? Hog parity would be $50 per hundredweight live weight. Corn would be $375 a bushel. Stock cattle, $65 per hundredweight. This would be if we were equal to the rest of the economy. Does this sound like the prices we have now are inflationary? Secondly, how has the government handled this recent situation in order to take and actually handle the prices that we are operating under? There is actually two lines of thought. One of them, that the government will control prices. And secondly, that it is the law of supply and demand. Again, let's take and analyze this law of supply and demand. In Thursday, March 31st, 1966, in the Drover's Journal, they said meat production drops 3% under a week ago, 9% below 1965. Last year, our meat imports were just a little under the imports of our record year, 1964. Yet we're taking this amount of production, bringing it in for, to do only one thing, decrease the prices to the American farmer when we are not even near parity prices. Secondly, let's take and look what happened recently. <coughs> we t had an import quota put on beef hides, which took and cut the price of beef animals around $3 per animal. This was put on 
evidently, for one reason, to take and control the price of shoes and only 20 cents of each raw hide, according to testimony, would go into a price of shoes. That should have a great effect. But we're entering into this period. If the law of supply and demand is operating, how can these prices be pushed downward? Evidently, there are other influences in the market than law of supply and demand. We have some other statements here that the breakdown of this pig crop report revealed that we should market between 9% less and 9% uh, less and 4% less than a year earlier through the end of June. This is a report from the Commodity Outlook. If this is true, how can the pork prices be pushed downward? Remember, we have been told for years that we are operating under the law of supply and demand. To me, it is up to every farmer to try to figure out who is controlling these prices, who is running his pocketbook. And when this is found out, then we can take and enter into a method of solving these problems. Ken, how does this actually take? How does it affect the country? It affects it in very many ways, Bob, and I'd like to point out uh, a couple of these. First of all, you probably have three main segments of the total economy, which would be, of course, agriculture, labor, and industry. Now, several analysts, economists, and I'm not going to argue uh, too much with what their philosophy is. The main thing I want to do is to point out that perhaps a little more of an, an analytic view on their part perhaps would point out the importance of agriculture and just where it stands in relation to everything else. Very many times that you will uh, talk to these people, the analysts, the economists, and they will pretty much tell you that agriculture is not the tail that wags the dog because they compare it to the gross national product of perhaps nearing $700 billion and the gross farm income of around $40 billion. Now, to the casual observer, this doesn't seem like it's very important in the total overall economy at all, especially if you will take a good look at this. You will be nearing the problem that is involved here because out of the $40 billion gross farm income, there's only around a true net farm income of around $7 billion. It's stated around 13, but a lot of this is charged off as rent, the food that we eat, and so on. So it's a true net income of perhaps around a 3% return. Now a 3% return is reflected in the fact that agriculture's total assets, totaling somewhere in the neighborhood of about 240 to $50 billion. Now I'm sure that all of these analysts economists, that if they would take a good look on both sides of the ledger, that you have a $250 billion industry in agriculture, and compare this against the gross farm income of $40 billion, a true farm net income of around $7 billion, and compare this with the gross national product of $700 billion, you can see that agriculture is the biggest single industry that we have in these United States. And it's a very important one. From the standpoint of consumption, from production, and entering into the economic cycle of the segments of our economy. And I'm not professing to be an economist of any kind, but merely using arithmetic as a basic science to point out the importance of agriculture as an industry. I'm not going to bother you with several figures, but generally we would like to purvey this type of uh, picture to you so that you can gain a little more insight into the problems that are facing the American farmer today, and for that matter, the total nation. Now, from the standpoint of consumption, we find that this big industry is the largest single consumer 
of steel, of rubber, and of petroleum products. Now, my question to the American public is they think they're paying too much for food, and I really don't think they are. And they're not thinking this, really. But my question to them is, how can we keep this big consumer as a single industry of these goods and services, steel, rubber, and petroleum products, in a position to buy or be the biggest consumer of them if we're not willing to pay a fair price to agriculture in the form of raw materials, cattle, hogs, uh, grains, and dairy products. Now, I think in what Bob has mentioned before, this is very important to bring out also. And that is for a long time already that we, in, as the current disparity ratio has been so great that we must take a look at the increase in wages, in earnings perhaps in the last 15 years compared to what it has been in agriculture as far as the farmer is concerned. Now this has been a very great disparity or a very dislocation, great dislocation. Now, we've seen at least that the mechanism or at least the pricing mechanism and the price that the consumer is going to pay for the food items, let's take this for an example, that as far as the great distribution outlets are concerned, the retail firms, that I think that these people are smart enough merchandisers at least, and I'm sure that I wouldn't be any different if I were in their position, but they're charging a price that the market will bear and this is only good business, but this is what they're doing. Now you'll find that the differential between what the farmer receives and what the consumer pays for these food items is very, very great. So you, this again reflects that the market is a market in which the consumer is charged a price that the market will bear and not necessarily reflecting too much in consideration of the cost of what the uh, hogs and cattle are on the hoof, and other products as well. But you can see the disparity in the, in the circle, supposedly, that we're trying to get into with uh, getting the farm prices up a little bit higher. Many people will tell you that it's profitable at, to raise hogs or produce hogs at perhaps the $18 level. Well, this, of course, is arbitrary, but from the economic standpoint, or using arithmetic as a basic science in computing the importance of agriculture to keep the nation in itself on an earning basis. Perhaps would be the biggest control of inflation that we ever had if we were to raise farm prices in balance with wages and other capital costs. But if we were to analyze this, uh, we would find that the, the great disparity ratio that has been in existence for 14 or 15 years already that it's pretty hard to gain status into this uh, circle uh, and to keep prices in balance with wages and capital cost because the very minute that you'll see any rise in farm costs as far as livestock is concerned these days reflects itself in that those retail and distribution centers or outlets are going to up the price that much higher to perhaps give agriculture a little bit more a little bit uh, worse image than what we've had before and consequently makes it very difficult to purvey this image to the consumer that agriculture is not getting paid in accordance with what we have to buy or with the earnings of labor and industry. So this again I would like to uh, have you think about and that is that farm prices are not what they should be today and as Bob has already told you that if we were really getting a price which would reflect the simple considerations, not only of cost of producing it, plus a reasonable profit, but including the factor that if we were getting a price in relation to the uh, increase in wages and other things in the past 15 or 20 years, perhaps, that hogs would be selling on the hoof at around $50 a hundred, corn at about $375, and cattle at about $65 per hundred. Now bear in mind that this is not what we're asking for. For the NFO program, the program of collective bargaining under the National Farmers Organization, we're not asking for these prices at all. We're asking for the simple consideration of cost of producing it plus a reasonable profit and gain status into this pricing mechanism which would 
keep us in balance with other segments of the economy. And I don't believe that we're asking for anything uh, too much at all. But from the standpoint of figuring these considerations and from the standpoint of being an able and willing consumer of these other products, if we have the income with which to do it, I believe it's going to justify itself several times over uh, in the earned basis or the earned income that this country needs to have to uh, be the uh, great leader that it is in stable government that we do have. So, Bob, I would like to throw this back to you for some, perhaps some comments that you might have on this at this time. One of the things that we have here, again, also from this article, I'm going to leave the name of the chain store out. It starts out the chain store operating about a thousand stores. Reported it lost money on every pound of poultry sold in 1963 and 64. Losses of three and three ten cents a pound in 64 and four and four tenths in 63 were incurred as lost leaders. However, other meat prices were increased to offset the poultry loss and show a profit. Why should beef, pork, and lamb subsidize the poultry trade? This is important because the poultry industry at this point is well over the 95% integrated at that integrated stage. So this is why the pressure, more pressure, is being used in order to take and force the livestock prices down. This is something that we cannot long endure because we have to take and analyze what is going to happen to the farmers if they take and try to operate under this type of an economic situation. I would like to read from a Sunday magazine and in a newspaper magazine, and I imagine most of you people had gotten it. But here I am going to read this in its entirety because I feel at this point it is very important. This is what our president has to say. In it. it starts out, poverty on farm. <coughs> According to President Johnson, there is no worse place to be poor in America than back home on the farm. With mechanization of farm methods and ever increasing number of farms are able to feed the country. Farmers of uneconomic small farms are becoming impoverished. There are approximately 20 million Americans directly involved in agriculture but nearly one half of the people classified as poor by the standards of Social Security Administration live on farms. Not only are they poor, but they receive less medical help and their children less education than any other. Trapped in a pocket of poverty, they are cut off from the national prosperity. They have little chance to improve their lot at a rate of 816,000 a year, the youngest and the cleverest of them are leaving the farm, joining the migration to the cities. It is just a question of time before only a few corporations own most of the productive farms in America. This is not NFO talking. This is other people telling us what will happen if we are, as farmers are not interested enough to take care of our own problem. Let's take and look and see what happened. This surplus figure is always being used as a weapon to take and depress farm prices. Since the year 1948, we have not produced as much meat in this country as we have consumed. In both 64 and 65, we had to import well over a billion pounds 
in order to take and meet the needs of the country. What have we done with farmers in the meantime? <coughs> we have taken, and in, uh, from the end of the war, when we had seven million family farms, we have taken and gotten it to around three and two-tenths million farmers, well over 50%. This, to me, is important because it is going to take people to produce this food. And the average age of the farmer, according to certain statistics, are either 56 to 58 years old. How are you going to get old people to increase food production. This is a problem that is going to face all of America, farmers and consumers. This is going to take serious thought of all people. One of the other things that happens, and this is bringing out the point that Ken touched on this ratio of one to seven per, or the one to seven ratio on farm dollars and the gross national income. This is a line that followed it from 27 to 42. And every farm gross farm dollar is increased seven times. This is important because agriculture during the past 15 and six to 16 years has been raped out of enough money that it is well putting us in a financial strait nationwide. This money that the farmers are not receiving for their food, this new wealth that is produced in the country that is not being paid for equally to the rest of the economy is only forcing the American government, both federal, state, and municipal, private industry, and regular consumers to take and increase their debt at the most rapid rate in the history of America. I have never known any business any government, any corporation that could take and be po prosperous through borrowing and using borrowed money in place of earned money. This is a situation that we are facing. We have only one thing that we can do. In this talk today, we brought out that the law of supply and demand is not working. That it seems that the government is not interested in getting us a fair price. We have one alternative, and this is as farmers to take and organize and do it ourselves. The historic records of the United States government prove conclusively that farm prices must be in balance with wages and interest costs in order to have a sound and fully operating national economy and relative full employment for our nation's people. Government records also prove that each dollar of gross farm income generates seven dollars of national income. Underpayment to agriculture for the past several years has caused our economy to operate on excessive credit and is a real danger to our nation's economy. How much longer can we afford to underpay our nation's farmers when it's costing our nation seven dollars for each dollar of underpayment to our American farmers. The members of the National Farmers Organization are calling on the rest of American farmers to join with them in an all-out effort to solve this great nation's problem. Join now.